Carter Report presents worship from the Community Adventist Fellowship in Glendale, California. A special welcome to all of our viewers in North America and our new friends and churches in Russia. Today you'll enjoy uplifting music and the preaching of the everlasting gospel by pastor, teacher, and evangelist John Carter. Please get your Bible and study the Word of God with us today. Thank you for joining us for Worship and Praise. I'm going to speak today on seven great signs and the return of the prophet Elijah. I'd like you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Malachi, the third chapter. You'll find that there are Bibles in the pews, and you'll be blessed if you turn to the passages. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. And I want you to notice some very important truths out of the most important book in the world, that of course is the Bible. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 
and verse 1 for a start. The Bible says here, and really this is God speaking through the prophet Malachi, he says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. When it talks here about the Lord coming to his temple, we now know that that is history. This verse is not referring to the second coming, but rather this verse is referring to the first coming. It refers to the fact of Jesus, God's uh, son, coming to his own temple in the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that before Jesus would come to his temple, God would send his messenger. Now that's very important. Because when we read the New Testament, we find that God had a messenger that preceded the coming of the Lord to his temple. And that messenger, every person here will know, was the, was the prophet John. If you'd please come over here to uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 13 to 17, you have a commentary on the life of John. Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 and onwards, please. Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 and onwards. Some of the most powerful words in the Bible are here recorded. Luke chapter 1, please. And I'm glad to see so many people opening their Bibles. This is important. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make a people, or make ready a people, prepared for the Lord. So, it is very, very plain when you read the scriptures that John was God's messenger. And before Jesus came the first time, before the Messiah came to his own temple, God raised up a man. And God sent him to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. Before God ever does anything of great importance in the world, my friend, God always sends his messenger. I want you to know that. And before Jesus came the first time, God raised up a man, and the Bible tells me that God filled that man with the Spirit of God, and the Bible says, with the Spirit of Elijah. And so when John came the first time, or when John came before Jesus came the first time, John was fulfilling the prophecy about the coming of the prophet Elijah. We'll see that is also so today. Would you please come back now to Malachi, uh, the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Now we've noticed Malachi 3, but now I want you to notice Malachi chapter 4, please. Malachi, the fourth chapter. Now we read Malachi 3 that talks about the first coming of the Messiah talks about the coming of the Lord and how God would send a messenger. And this messenger was none other than John the Baptist who came with the spirit of Elijah. Now Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1 says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Is that the time of the first coming or the second coming? This is the second coming. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that shall leave them neither root nor branch. The Bible apparently does not teach the doctrine of universal salvation, 
The Bible doesn't teach the idea that every person is going to be saved. Because the Bible teaches here that when the Lord comes the second time, it is going to be a great and dreadful day and those who have rejected the claims of Christ upon their lives are going to be like stubble and they're going to be burnt up. That is going to be judgment day. Now notice verse 5 because it talks here about a messenger. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now that's not the first coming, is it? That's the second coming. Malachi 3 is the first coming. Malachi 4 is the second coming. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So let me just try to make this as plain as I can to you. In Malachi, you have two comings. You have the coming of the Lord to his temple. That's when Jesus came to the Jewish temple, roughly 2,000 years ago. And God sent a messenger, and that messenger was John the Baptist, and his work was to prepare the way of the Lord. And so John came in the spirit of Elijah. But the Bible says in Malachi chapter 4, there is coming another day. There is going to be the day that is going to burn as an oven. We know this is the day of judgment. And the Bible says that before this day of judgment is consummated, God is going to send the prophet Elijah. And so it is plain in the scriptures in the book of Malachi and from reading texts in the New Testament that, Mal uh, that the Bible teaches that Elijah comes to the world twice. He comes be before the first coming, but he returns before the second coming. I want you to notice now seven great signs in the Bible that you can see being fulfilled today in the world that seem to indicate very, very strongly that we are living in that little period of time just before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I want you to notice, we could go through many great signs, but I want you to notice seven great signs. And because we're going to move through this quickly, it won't be necessary for you to turn up every passage that I refer to when I talk about the seven great signs. The seven great signs, the first one, is world evangelism. Jesus said in Matthew 24, you know the passage, Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what's going to happen? The end is going to come. And the end that Jesus is referring to there is the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. We are seeing today around the world the Holy Spirit being poured out in a remarkable way so that the gospel can be taken to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. To the friends who are watching on 3ABN, let me say this to you, 3ABN and the preaching of the gospel are complementing each other because 3ABN is helping to fulfill this Bible prophecy. The Bible says the gospel is going to be preached and then the end is going to come. I want to say to you today that for the first time in the history of the world, the gospel is now going like wildfire around the earth in Russia, even in China. Amen. Great sign number two. We're talking about seven great signs. Sign number two. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Now, just listen to this. Second Thessalonians 2 talks about the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And it says that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord occurs, there is going to come, and here are the words of Scripture, a falling away. The Bible says that in the last days, things are not going to get better and be better, but things are going to get worse as the world and the church experience a falling away from the truth. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in another place that evil men are going to wax 
worse. Things are going to, to reach a, a great time of trouble in the world. And the Bible talks about a great apostasy in the world and also in the church. So that's sign number two. I believe today with all my heart, and I think you would be forced to agree with me, that we are living in a time of great apostasy in the world and in Christendom. I believe we're living in the time that is uh, spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2, that has two applications. 2 Thessalonians 2 refers to the rise of the Antichrist in the Middle Ages, but it also refers to the rise of the Antichrist in the last days, and the rise of the Antichrist in the last days is brought about by the great falling away in Christendom and in the world. Sign number three, Jesus said, that natural disasters would increase. You remember, I spoke about it last week and referred to it the week before this. Jesus spoke about the birth pangs of the new age. And as the birth pangs become more severe and closer together, so it'll be in the last days. Jesus spoke about wars and famines and pestilences and Los Angeles earthquakes. So sign number three, an increase in natural disasters. Sign number four, the rise, the rule, and the reign of the Antichrist. This is described in Daniel chapter 7 and also in Revelation chapter 13. In the scriptures, the Antichrist is not a person per se. The Antichrist is a system of apostasy, and the Antichrist is an amalgamation of a corrupt religious system with a corrupt state. This is Antichrist. I believe today the sign number four is in the process of being fulfilled, and I believe that soon we will see the open manifestation as never before of the great Antichrist who will deceive the world. I believe that the Antichrist is here today. Sign number five, great sign number five, Jesus spoke about a great persecution of believers. Jesus said, the time will come when they will hate you and persecute you, say all evil against you falsely for my name's sake, and they will cast you out of the synagogue or out of the church. Jesus spoke about the great tribulation. It is very, very plain when you read the, 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 the actual words of Jesus and leave aside the books of the theologians and would-be theologians, that the great tribulation takes place before the return of Jesus. Now I know there are lots and lots of wonderful evangelical Christians whom I consider to be my, my dear friends who believe in a tribulation, the great tribulation, after the second coming. But I believe that if you go according to Scripture, the great tribulation precedes the second coming and this becomes an awful time of persecution for true Christians. I've said this before, but I find it hard to understand how Christians here in the United States and in Australia can say there'll be no tribulation upon the church because the church will be raptured home to, to glory. No tribulation upon the church. How do you say that to the Russians and the Chinese? How do you say that? That theology that sounds so good here in America doesn't sound very good in Russia. It doesn't hold up because they are already in the midst of the tribulation. And so the Bible says in the last days one of the great signs is going to be a fearful time of persecution against Christians. Great sign number six is this. The peace and the safety proclamation. What am I talking about? The peace and the safety proclamation. I was talking to my dear friend Charles McMullen, a great friend and a great Christian supporter on Thursday. He said, John, I believe the time is near. He said, haven't you noticed all the time the politicians are talking about peace, safety, and a new era? 
Did you know in the book of Thessalonians it says you're not to be ignorant concerning the times or the seasons or the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Because the Bible says when they say peace and safety, then destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman who's about to give birth to a baby. It is interesting that in the scriptures that the last days are described in the Bible in the terminology of the destruction of the old city of Babylon. You remember what happened? There was Belshazzar's feast. They were having a great time. A wine, women, and song. They, they believed that the city was impregnable, was absolutely secure. You know the story. And when they considered that the city was secure, and when they were talking peace and safety, then destruction came upon Babylon. The Bible says it is going to be exactly the same in the last days, that the world will be engaged in a great feast as they had in the time of Belshazzar, and then, when everything seems glorious, the end is going to come. I would suggest we're living in that time. And sign number seven, I discussed with my friend Bob New this week. It's a very important sign, particularly for us living here in Los Angeles. Sign number seven is a collapse of morality, of law and order. I was reading the works of a prominent theologian this week, and he said something in his writings that pulled me up. He said, never before in the history of the human race has the present civilization, or let me put this in another way, he said, never before in the history of the world or the human race has the present day civilization, our civilization, been so like the old Roman civilization. Did you know that when Jesus came the first time, there was a world government, the Roman Empire, there was a time of peace around the world, there was a marvelous system of communication. They had chariots that didn't run on dirt tracks, but they ran on paved roads. You could send a letter which would reach any part of the Roman Empire in virtually just a few days. They had a language which everybody understood. It was the language of the New Testament, of Greek. And at the same time as they had that situation, the Roman Empire was being destroyed and there was a collapse of law and order and the home was breaking up and divorces had gone through the roof. That sounds like our day. Jesus came when the world was ready and Jesus is going to come again when the world is ready. I want to tell you, my friend, the world is ready today. The world is ready today. Did you know that in the Bible, the, Jesus draws a parallel between the days of Noah and the last days? The days of Noah were days of violence, wickedness, and immorality. And then Jesus, in Matthew 24, draws a parallel between the days that saw the end of Jerusalem and the last days. Before Jerusalem was overthrown by the Romans, Jerusalem became a city of anarchy. You had different groups of people in the city who were fighting and killing each other, fighting over food. And as it was in the Roman Empire, you know what happened just before Jerusalem was overthrown too? In the Roman Empire and in the city of Jerusalem, they had set up a welfare state and to keep the people in subjection to the government, they gave everybody a daily ration and they entertained them with the gladiators. They had blood sports and welfare. And the nation became spiritually, morally, and physically bankrupt. And that was the end. This is the same as it is today. Here we have seven great signs. I want to tell you, my friend, Jesus is going to come soon. Amen. And before Jesus came the first time, God sent a messenger, and his name was John the Baptist. And he came with the spirit and the power of Elijah. 
And the Bible said he came with a message to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now listen, that's Malachi 3. But Malachi 4, which doesn't talk about the first coming, but talks about the second coming, Malachi chapter 4 says that in the great, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, God is going to send the prophet Elijah. If we are living truly in the last days, then the prophet Elijah ought to be here in the world somewhere today, I believe. So I want you please to take your Bible and I want you to notice some passages here. Matthew chapter 17 and verses 10 and onwards. Matthew 17 verses 10 and onwards. And his disciples asked him saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? They understood the prophecy of Malachi. You see, they understood this. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah is truly coming first and will restore all things. Now, please tell me, Helen, is this past tense, present tense, or future tense? Future tense. Hmm. He, is coming. He, he is coming. So Jesus said, yes, the scribes are right, because they're quoting from Malachi. Elijah is going to come and he will restore all things. Notice Jesus here uses future tense. This is important. But then verse 12, but I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they listed, whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now please think about this. Jesus said, scribes are right. Elijah is going to come. He's going to come soon. He's going to restore all things. But then Jesus said, but I say to you, Elijah has already come. And they did to him whatever they wanted to do. Then this, the, the disciples understood that Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. Now, I want you to come over here now to another passage, John chapter 1, 19 to 21. And this is a strange passage, dear people, because it seems to be almost a contradiction. John chapter 1. And verse 19 to 21, it doesn't seem to be a contradiction, it is a contradiction. John chapter 1 and verse 19 to 21. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So... As plain as a person can read what the Bible says, Jesus said that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Malachi about the return of Elijah. But then on some other occasion when people came and asked John, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not Elijah. So here you have a contradiction, an apparent contradiction between the words of Jesus and the words of John. How does a person explain it? How does a person explain it? Does the Bible really contradict itself? How do we explain it? John the Baptist was not Elijah in the sense that he was Elijah resurrected or no, he couldn't have been resurrected because Elijah's in heaven. He wasn't Elijah come back to this earth as a person. But the Bible tells us when John the Baptist came, God placed into his life the spirit, the power, and the message of the prophet Elijah. So when a person comes, or if an organization, a group of people arise with the message and the spirit and the power of Elijah, it can be said that they fulfill the prophecy of the return of Elijah. Is that plain to you? Now, I want you to come to this passage again that we've already noticed, so it'll sink into our minds. Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 and onwards, please. And I, I'm so glad that you folks are turning up the passages, because... Today we are studying the word together. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 13 to 17, please. Luke chapter 1, verse 13 to 17. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That's what Elijah did. 
and he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Listen carefully to what I want to say, what the Bible says. The Bible says that the prophecy concerning the return of Elijah was fulfilled not in the sense that Elijah came back as the real Elijah. Because where is Elijah? In the grave. Hmm. Where's he's in heaven. Oh, yeah. he's Sister in heaven. Helen, he's in heaven. Don't put him in the grave when he's in heaven. Elijah. In a chariot. <laughs> well, he went there in a chariot. He might not be in the chariot now, but he went to heaven. So Elijah, when he, d no, he didn't die. He went straight home to glory. But Jesus said, Elijah comes back. The Bible says he comes back. John the Baptist says, I'm not Elijah. Jesus says he is Elijah. So how do we understand it? It's the spirit and the power. It is the message. Not only just the message. Sometimes we just talk about the Elijah message. That's not good enough. You've got to have the spirit and the power. What's the good of having a message if you don't have the spirit and the power? You know? A lot of us have got a message, but we've got nothing inside. You know. The Bible tells us that we are to, Jesus says we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. There you've got the message and the power. A lot of people have only got the message, but they don't have the power. And some people think they've got the power and they've got no message. But you've got to have them both together. And so John the Baptist fulfilled the, the prophecy of Malachi concerning the first coming because he had the spirit and the power and he had the message. Okay, so the Bible says in the last days before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord that Elijah is going to come back. So we have to look for a person or people who've got a message and they have the spirit and they have the power. And when they have all three the message, the spirit, and the power, they will constitute the return of the prophet Elijah. Is that right? Amen. Yeah, that's right. Now, let me say this to you. This is very important. I was reading an article recently by my friend Robert Falkenberg. He made a very pertinent and an excellent statement. He said, listen to this, because some would say, I don't like this statement, but what he said was absolutely true. He is a truly great leader, that man. He said this, God does not empower institutions. Amen. Did you get that? Oh boy, what a heresy that is. God does not empower institutions. God empowers people. Amen. Hear that? God never empowers. God never says, well, here's a denomination. I'm going to empower that denomination. God takes people and he empowers them. And if all those people get together and form a denomination, well, that's great. Then the denomination is empowered. But God does not empower institutions. God empowers people. And God empowered Elijah. And God empowered John the Baptist. Now, what was John the Baptist like, I wonder? Would you come over here to Matthew chapter 11? And we have a marvelous description given by Jesus of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 verses 1 to 10. Matthew 11. Please turn the passages. I want you to see them, please, if you don't mind. Matthew 11 verses 1 and onwards. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? What does it tell you about John? Well, it tells you he was in prison. Yeah, that's absolutely sure. It tells you he was in prison. But it tells you that John had doubts. Hmm. Was John a perfect person? Perfect in Christ. Perfect in Christ. Not perfect in himself. John got a little depressed. In fact, when he was sitting there in prison, he, he got a lot depressed. Just because a person gets doubts doesn't mean he's not a child of God. This man was the greatest, greatest of the prophets. But he said, are you the one to come 
or should we look for somebody else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me, John. What a beautiful way of t saying it to John. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out, out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. What does that mean? A wimp. A wimp. Yeah. As we call, say in Australia, a sook. <laughs> yeah, sooky. We talk about sooky calves. You know, a little, I won't get into that. It's a whole new cultural world. Jesus said, what did you go out to see? A reed. What does a reed do? Why? It goes the way of the wind. Are you a reed? What's a reed like? A reed is a person who says, well, I believe this today. And then they hear somebody else, oh, I believe that today. They just go any which way ever. No backbone. They're a person who sits on a committee and when most people vote, they just put up their hand too. They just go with the crowd. In fact, before they start to vote, they put their finger in their mouth and they hold it up to see the way the wind's blowing. When they find out the way the wind's blowing, they vote that way. Oh, they're not men. They're reeds, you see. John the Baptist was a man. He wasn't a reed, he was an oak. What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? What does that mean? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What does that mean? John was not a person, my friend, who apparently was hooked on the prosperity gospel. Mm. John was a simple man. He lived in a simple way. <laughs> so Jesus said, when he went out in the wilderness to see, what did you see? Did you go out to see a dandy? A mamby-pamby? A mamby-pamby dandy? No, he said, what did you go out to see? He said, I'll tell you what you went out to see. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. John was God's messenger, God's man. Uh, I remember years ago when I went as a student to Avondale College, I was 16 years of age, down from the, the hills in North Queensland where I'd been driving a bulldozer. Uh, that's how I got some money to go through college. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college, but I went and drove a bulldozer for 16 hours a day, which was probably the best thing I could have done, and I enjoyed every minute of it. I like a bulldozer because you can do things with it, push a lot of things around, and you know, it's just great. You see what you've done after you've had a bulldozer. <laughs> Don't want you to try to psychoanalyze me, doctor, over here. We were given a little handbook Avondale Handbook. That handbook told you what you could do and what you couldn't do. It was mainly the second things, mainly the things you couldn't do. When you went to Avondale in those days, there weren't a lot of things you could do. Couldn't look at the girls, couldn't talk to the girls, couldn't sit with the girls even. Couldn't do any of those things. Um, but there was a little statement in the front of the Avondale Handbook which was which, which was marvelous. It was a statement from Ellen White, and I tried to find it last night in the Ellen White Index, but the people who put it together couldn't have heard about this statement because I couldn't find it. Or maybe I had my wrong glasses on. It said something like this. This is a famous statement in the Adventist church. It said, Ellen White said this, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Now when she's talking about men there, she's using a generic term. She's talking about men and women, but men and women in the category of John the Baptist. She said, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who are not put-ons. Men who are transparently honest. Men who are not devious. Not con men. 
world's full of those in the church and in the world. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. What's this needle to the pole business? Well, that's a compass. And as you know, the needle always turns to the pole. It always points in the one direction. It is always reliable. It is constant, it is steady, it is reliable. The prophet said, the greatest one of the world is the one of men, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will not be bought or sold. Has been said, every man has his price. It's true with most. It's not true of a true disciple of Jesus. There's a movie, which I haven't seen, don't plan to see, about a, a couple who go to Las Vegas, and the woman is offered a million dollars if she'll sleep with a man. She says, it's a lot of money. It's only a night. So she had a price. Men who will not be bought or sold at any price, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. That's the great need of the world, the great need of the church. That was John the Baptist. That was Elijah. Now in the last days, God is going to have a people like that. That's why the Lord may have to send all of us a lot of persecution. You know that? Because where we live today, my dearly beloved friends, I want to tell you something. In the Christian church, pardon my saying this so frankly, we have produced a pretty sickly mob. We really have. Pretty weak people. You know, they'll be Christians only if they got lots and lots of money. Or else they'll go to church only if it's very convenient. But God is going to have, before the second coming, a people who will carry his message, who will be strong in Christ. I feel dreadfully sorry for people who are mentally, emotionally, and spiritually unstable. Because the Lord will have to send them a terrible lot of persecution and trouble to try to help them. That's why the Lord sends us trouble. Because we need the trouble. That's why the Lord sends me trouble. Beverly says to me, you must have been terribly bad for all this to happen to you. But the Lord sends us trouble because we need it. And maybe some of us here are in for a lot of trouble. Because the Lord wants to make something out of us. Now, would you please notice with me the last day message? Would you do that? Come over here to 1 Kings chapter 16. And I'm going to really whiz through this. 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. And I want you to notice the days of Elijah, and then we'll analyze what his message is, and we'll see how it's appropriate for us today. 1 Kings 16 verse 1. In the 38th year of... Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omni, became king over Israel. Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He must have been bad. Now, it came to pass as though it had been a trifling thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, that he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. What's it sound like to you? Hmm? Jay, what's it sound like? He was a bad man. But what's it sound like? What's it sound like? Those circumstances. Sounds like today. So God raised up a firebrand. Well, he wasn't a churchman. No, no, no. He wasn't a wimp. He was a man. And if you notice chapter 17, verse 1, and Elijah the Tishbite, 
of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand there, show me no dew or rain these years except my word. He said, There is going to be a judgment on the land because of the sin of the land. Judgments come upon us because of the sin of the land. Now we talked about that last week. That's not the only reason, of course, but that's one of the reasons. And then if you come to chapter 18 and verse 16, chapter 18 and verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Isn't it interesting that the man who was calling for reformation was called the troubler? Hey, what are you doing here in Israel causing all this trouble? Hmm. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal. They were laid on, stacked four high. And the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Then Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you halt or falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But of Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. And you wonder why, don't you? They didn't want to get committed. Now let me sum it up. Here is a nation that has turned away from God, a nation that has set up graven images, a nation that has turned its back on the great creator God, an idolatrous nation, and the wrath of God is coming upon the nation. God raises up a man. Not a wimp, not a mamby-pamby, but God raises up a man. God says, go and tell him. So he goes and tells them, and they say, what are you causing all this trouble for? And so the issue is, the Creator God, His worship, and the keeping of God's commandments. That's the issue. Now when you come to the days of John the Baptist, you'll find the same thing happened. The people of God had turned their backs on the Creator. They'd set up their own religion, and God sent John the Baptist with the message of Elijah. Now folks, I want to tell you this. The times in which we live demand the return of the message and the power and the spirit of Elijah. Amen. Do we read of such a message in the Bible? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Now, don't look it up because we don't have time, but we read about in Isaiah 58 where God is going to raise up people who are going to rebuild the old waste places. They're going to be called restorers of the breach. They're going to be people who uphold the great truth about Jesus, the truth that he is the creator God, and they're going to call people to walk in harmony with his law. That's Isaiah 58. And then if you turn to Revelation 14, and you ought to know it by heart, in Revelation 4, J and David, you have a great message that you may not know a lot about yet, but it is the message of the three angels. And before Jesus comes a second time, he sends the message of the three angels, and the first message is the everlasting gospel, the good news that there is a God and he loves us, and Jesus died for us. And then it goes on and says, Worship him who made heaven and earth. Take your eyes off the idols of the world and worship the Creator. Are there idols in Los Angeles? You better believe it. There are a million of them. A million of them. And then it talks about keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. That is the message for these last days. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this because I'm, I'm going to... Read your statement here that I love out of one of my favorite books, The Desire of Ages, written by Alan White. And I want you, to, want you to hear what the message of Elijah is, God's last day message. This is pretty strong stuff. What I like about the writings of Alan White is that she gets down to the point. She doesn't mess around a lot. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a real politician, you know. It says, 
She says, he saw his people deceived, self-satisfied, asleep in their sins. He longed to arouse them to a holier life. The message that God had given him to bear was destined to startle them from their lethargy and cause them to tremble because of their great weakness. Now, I know I'm not crazy. I know there are lots of people who don't like plain preaching. They like the preaching that says you're okay and I'm okay and we're all going to heaven. Let's all laugh. Trouble is that most of that is garbage. It appeals to people who do not really want to follow Christ. A lot of people like that. That's not what I preach. I don't believe it. Before the seed of the gospel could find lodgment, the soil of the heart must be broken up. Before they would seek healing from Jesus, they must be awakened to their danger from the wounds of sin. If you go along to church and the preacher strokes you, everybody needs a bit of stroking. I don't mind a bit of it on occasions myself. Everybody needs a bit of stroking, but if you go along to church and all you hear is stroke, 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 aren't you lovely? Aren't, isn't everything perfect? Isn't everything great? Don't we look beautiful? Aren't our teeth nice? That's bunk, folks. But people pay for it, you know. They like it. Mm, God does not send messages to flatter the sinner. He delivers no message of peace to lull the unsanctified into false security. He lays heavy burdens upon the conscience of the wrongdoer and pierces the soul with arrows of conviction. The ministering angels present to him the fearful judgments of God to deepen the sense of need and prompt the cry, What must I do to be saved? Then the hand that is humbled in the dust lifts up the penitent, the voice that has rebuked sin and put to shame pride and ambition inquires with tenderest sympathy, What wilt thou that I do unto thee? So the message from God for the last days is plain and pointed and strong. And it calls us to get ready for the coming of Christ by repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, let me say this. Please bear with me. This message that I'm talking about today is not likely that it's going to convert the world or even the church. Because I say to you, on the, on the word of God, we live in an evil generation. When people want an easy religion, but the problem is, after they've trusted the easy preachers, they're going to wake up in an uneasy hell. Mm -hmm. And the preachers that they praise today, and they say, you ought to hear him, he's wonderful, makes you feel good. They're going to damn them one day when they're burning. So God has a message with fire, power, and the spirit of Elijah in it. I want to tell you this. You are appointed by God to be his messenger. Not just me. Every person who names the name of Christ, I'm glad that... Uh, Steve was out at that bookstore getting over to these two guys and trying to point them the way of salvation. Amen. I'm glad that Jay is here today. I'm glad that David is here. And, and David has joined the small group class because he said, I want to share what I've heard. Amen. It's only been here for a few weeks. You can't hold him down. He wants to share it. You see? Amen. Every one of us is appointed to be his messenger. You say, I don't believe that. I'm just there to sit in the pew and to keep my hair straight. <coughs> I want to tell you, you won't get to heaven with that theology or that attitude. You and I are called to be his representatives, to be his messengers. Now let me say to Rose, whom we love, Rose who is a psychiatrist, 
It's a great job, but your first job, Rose, is not psychiatry. It is to tell people about the gospel. Mm -hmm. Jay, don't know what job you've got, but that's not your first job. It's to tell people about Christ and the gospel. And David, your first job is not acting because we got something a lot better than acting. We got the real thing. You see? The secret of mental stability, the secret of spiritual stability, the secret of courage, the difference between a man and a wimp, the difference between a reed and an oak, is the vision splendid. He looked upon the king in his beauty and felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. He was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger, unawed by the human, because he'd bowed low before the king of kings. Mm. Let me say to you today, if you will accept it, you are his messengers.